Hello everyone, welcome to this new year, 2022, and welcome to this first new message of the year. Before we begin, let's commit this time to the Lord, as we usually do, in prayer. Heavenly Father, I once again thank you for your word, thank you for your Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth. Please grant us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying this day. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, brethren. Well, today we're going to look at something which I believe is, is important to us in the day that we live. And it's from the Old Testament. Now this seems to be... Uh, something not looked at very much by much of the church these days. The Old Testament is looked on as archaic, not relative, but believe me, it is very relative. Nothing in the Word of God is irrelevant. As the New Testament writers say, these things were written for our benefit, that we may learn. Okay, so let's begin. I've called this message Ezekiel's Call to Ministry. Ezekiel's Call to Ministry. And although the text uh, that I've taken this message from is quite large, it's Ezekiel 1 from verse 25 to Ezekiel chapter 3. It takes in the call of Ezekiel, but we're not going to be looking at the whole of it, just parts of it. Okay, so don't be afraid. Although it's a large portion of scripture, we're not going to be reading in depth every single verse of that portion. But in your own time, I'd encourage you to read Ezekiel chapter 1 from verse 25 through to ver uh, chapter 3 of Ezekiel. Okay. Now I'd like us to take a look at this call of Ezekiel to his ministry as I believe it speaks directly to us today in the day that we live in 2022. I know that as I've said this is a lot of scripture to get through and we will be looking at a lot of scriptures as we go through today but bear with me. We'll not be studying each verse in detail but looking at sections of it and how it relates to us. Now the writings of Ezekiel have much to teach us today, brethren. In fact, this book is closely associated with the book of Revelation, as you'll see as we progress. There's also a great similarity between this call of Ezekiel and that of the Apostle Paul. In fact, that's what we're going to look at briefly first. So turn with me, if you will, firstly to Ezekiel chapter 1. And we're going to look specifically at two small sections of Ezekiel. First, we're going to read Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Let's read them together. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the colour of amber, as the appearance of fire round about, within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke. Now, 
straight through to Ezekiel chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. Ezekiel chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. This is carrying on. And he said, chap, uh, chapter 2 verse 1, And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. Praise God. Strong words, aren't they? What a vision Ezekiel had there. And this, as we saw with the letters of Paul to the Corinthian church, shows that the chapters and verse numbers are not really helpful, as I think they were intended to be. As we're there, we flowed from chapter 1, the end of chapter 1, straight into chapter 2 without hesitation. Anyway, now we have read Ezekiel's call, let us now read that of the Apostle Paul. And for this, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. <coughs> Excuse me. Acts chapter 26, beginning at verse 12. We're going to read through to verse 18. Acts 26, beginning at verse 12. Let's read together. Verse 12. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and then, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom I now send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now, brethren, I hope that you can see the similarity between the two. They're not exactly the same words, but you can see the similarity between the two calls here, I, I hope. And I would like you to note the following verses. Ezekiel chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 that we read and Acts 26 verses 16 and 17 almost the, the end of both uh, portions of scripture there. Now in Ezekiel it says, And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak to thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spoke to me, and, I, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake to me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation, that hath rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me even to this very day. Acts 26 But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared to thee this, for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. Now the people there are the Jews, the Jewish people, the people of Israel. And he says, he adds to Paul, the Gentiles. Now Ezekiel, of course, was sent 
to the people of Israel, who at the time were in captivity in Babylon, amongst the Gentiles in Babylon, the Chaldeans. Paul, though, was sent predominantly to the Gentiles, although he always preached in a synagogue to the Jews first, as he himself stated here in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or to the Gentile. <coughs> now in this, in these scriptures, these scriptures, you should see and understand that God has never finished with the Jewish people. God has not finished with Israel at all, in no way. And if you, fact, if you read Romans 9 to 11, you'll see why. Quite clearly, you'll see that it is to the stock of the Jews, the stock of Israel, that we as Gentile believers are grafted in. We are grafted in to them. They are the root and the stock. We, as Gentiles, have been grafted in to that stock, which is Israel. Praise God. And God will again restore Israel to its rightful place before God. There is, though, more in common between Ezekiel and the Apostle Paul, as you will now see. Ezekiel was a priest. Not only this, he was the son of a priest, possibly of the line of Zadok, the priest, Zadok. Now see here, Ezekiel 1, verse 3. Ezekiel 1, verse 3. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Chabar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. But now Paul was also a priest, wasn't he? He was both taught and prepared for a future position, possibly in the Sanhedrin, as a Pharisee. And he was taught by one of, one of the most, if not the most famous rabbi, Rabbi Gamaliel. Now because of his noble birth, Ezekiel was taken in an earlier phase of the captivity. There were several phases where certain portions of uh, the Jews were taken into captivity at different times. And Ezekiel, as uh, an, of nobility, of noble birth, would have been taken in one of the first, if not the first, phases. His ministry to the Jewish people was now as a prophet, as there was no temple anymore for priests to perform the rites and rituals of the Jewish faith. The temple was now destroyed. There was nowhere. There was no ark of God. There was no holy place or most holy place. And there was no way that they could perform the Jewish religion. So Ezekiel could no longer be a priest in that sense. So now God was raising him up to be a prophet. His ministry to the Jewish people was now as a prophet, as there was, as I've said, no more temple for priestly rites and rituals. God would use him, Ezekiel, to hammer home to the minds of the Jewish people in captivity that they were now in exile from the land because of their rebelliousness and idolatry against God. Ezekiel had the task of showing them <coughs> that the Babylonians were now the instruments of God for their correction and also to counter the idea of many of the people at this time of exile that it would be short-lived. Many of them believed that God would bring them back soon this is what the false prophets had told them. If 
you read the book of Jeremiah, you will see, see that, that Jeremiah constantly fought against the false prophets and tried to encourage the Jewish people in Judah to go into Babylon. That God would look after them there and bring them back. God also used Ezekiel to encourage them though that there was light at the end of the tunnel as it were. In other words, that there was indeed a future for them <coughs> back in their homeland. Please excuse my coughing, I'm still struggling a little bit with a chest infection. Please bear with me. Paul on the other hand was to be used by God in the building and establishing of the Church of Christ, although in its early stages, and to pioneer work amongst the Gentile world. Hence he is sometimes called the Apostle to the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul is not the only one with whom Ezekiel has similarities in ministry. As I stated earlier, this initial calling of Ezekiel has a striking resemblance to the beginning of the book of Revelation, which was penned by the Apostle John. Now let's take a look at that just for a moment, that beginning of the book of Revelation. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to look at four verses, from verse 12 to verse 15. Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. Verse 12, let's read together. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one unto the like of the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Hallelujah. What a glorious picture of our risen Lord, King of Kings. Now I hope that you can see the similarity there between these verses that we've just read and that of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. The similarities do not end there though, brethren. There is so much more to look at. To take one more example, just one more example, and then we'll move on. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Verse 1 of Revelation 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Now remember it spoke of the likeness of a rainbow in Ezekiel that we read. Now brethren, we have our hope seen that Ezekiel prophesied for his time. The Apostle Paul was used by God for his own time. And the Apostle John, at the end of his life, was inspired by God to write of a time yet to come. Now all three were used mightily of God, all at different times, yet all linked together by the similarities that we have seen. Why is this though? Well, a very wise man once wrote the following scripture. Now I'm going to read Ezekiel, uh, sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes 
chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Remember, King Solomon wrote these very wise words. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Verse 9, let's read together. The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of all time, which was before. There is no new thing under the sun, brethren. Yes, brethren, there is nothing new under the sun. God has had to send men to bring his word to proclaim warnings of impending judgment for sin and disobedience to his word and also prophetic promises of future restoration for his people when they repent throughout the ages. Why there was Ezekiel's ministry so important for us to study today, you might ask? The answer to this question is somewhat complicated, brethren, but please bear with me as we seek to answer this important question, and it, believe me, it is important for our day. <coughs> Ezekiel was born in or near Jerusalem, as I've said, to a noble priestly family. There is, there is too much speculation as to how the 30 years mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 1-1 one, one is calculated, so I will only say that historically a priest began his ministry officially at the age of 30. Now whether we take that as the age of Ezekiel when he was given his ministry by God or how many years he's been there, we cannot say. Only to state the fact that a priest began his official ministry at the age of of 30. Now, in Ezekiel's case, he would have been taken amongst possibly the first captives, as I've said, as a young boy or a young man. The interesting point here, though, being that there was now no temple for the ministry of a priest, as I alluded to before. The temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians. God had allowed this because of the corruption of the temple worship and because of the willful rebellion of the people of God to the warnings of the prophets, as I already said, such as I, uh, Jeremiah and others. So then, now we see Ezekiel, a priest, now being called by God to be a different type of minister, a prophet. As there was no longer a temple to worship in and to bring sacrifices for sin, there had to be now a new way of worship for the Jewish faith to survive. That new way would be a focus upon the Word of God. <coughs> now let me say here as an aside, it was here in Babylon, in the captivity, that the idea of the synagogue type of worship was founded. Let me say that again. It was here in Babylon that the seed of the idea of synagogue as a type of worship was founded. The synagogue as we know it today is, is the typical form of Jewish worship. The call upon Ezekiel was one where he was to be the mouthpiece of God, as it were. God would tell him what he was to say to the people, and he was then to tell them exactly what God had said. Now, to prepare this man, who had been trained to be a priest, remember, to be a preacher prophet, God tells him the following. Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 3 to 7. 
Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 3 to 7. Verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day, for they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. And thou doest well, do dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. How would you like that for a calling of God? Well, this was something that was said of the people of God right from their time with Moses in the wilderness, wasn't it? And it's something also repeated by Stephen, the disciple of Jesus, just before he was stoned. Now I'm going to read now from Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Let me repeat that, brethren. Stephen speaking here to the Jewish people, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Now this does not, though, only apply to the people of God, the Jews. It can also be said of the body of Christ. Because how many in the church today live act and speak in the same way as those unsaved in the world around them. Many would say, I have a right to do this, or I have a right to do that, I deserve this, or I deserve that. Many are quick to judge others, but resent being judged themselves. Brethren, I have to say, we are supposed to be surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our old life, our old thoughts and old ways are to be dead with Christ upon the cross. We are now disciples of Christ, learning to live his life through our bodies. To refuse this way is to become just as rebellious as were Israel therefore deserving to be called stiff-necked, impudent and uncircumcised in heart. Remember here, brethren, that part of the Jewish faith, part of the Jewish religion, was to be circumcised on the eighth day. But it wasn't the heart that was physically circumcised, was it? But here God calls them uncircumcised in heart. And so are we, if we do not do what the Lord instructs us to do. As such, it is foolish to expect the blessing of the Lord to flow through us. This is predominantly, I believe, why we as the body of Christ are in such a disarray today and why we seem to have little effect upon this dark world that is all around us. It is for this reason, brethren, that I believe the call of Ezekiel is as important for us to understand today as it was for the captives there in Babylon. <coughs> now, brethren, we have seen why Ezekiel has been called, 
The people had done their own thing for so long and had not heeded the voice of the prophets that God had sent to them, but instead listening to the corrupted leaders around them, thus caused them to bring them into captivity, into a place where they could no longer worship, in a way or in a place that they were used to. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Does it sound familiar, brothers and sisters? Now, if you stop and think for a minute, <coughs> and think about how this so-called pandemic has affected not just the world, but affected the church, I think that you will see quite a similarity in situation. Never in my life, and never in the lifetime of anyone listening to this message, I would say, has anything like the restrictions been imposed on the church and on the broader world. Church is being closed, doors locked, congregations being prevented from coming together to worship the living God. Brethren, I'm saying to you today that God has allowed this situation he hasn't caused it, but he has allowed this situation with the COVID-19 virus to reveal just to whom we are faithful. The reaction of governments around the world to this virus has done what two world wars could not do. That is the closure of churches worldwide to the worship of Almighty God and his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God is very clear about worship in the last days, my brothers and sisters, and it's a word that we should not ignore. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 27. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 27. Verse 23 of Hebrews 10. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. These are fearful words, brethren. Strong words, but strong words to the body of Christ not to the world, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. What is the day approaching? The day approaching is the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So looking for and seeking the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are supposed to be assembling ourselves together much more, not less. Now I fear that belief of an approaching judgment of God upon a wicked and sinful world has to a great extent been lost in the body of Christ today, in the church as a whole. Brethren, the whole point of the Bible as an existing record is that those who are born again should learn from the mistakes of the past. Let me say that again. The Bible as an existing record, its purpose is that those who are born again should learn from the mistakes of the past. The people of God had been taken into captivity into Babylon because they had not heeded the final warnings of God over their rebelliousness. Therefore they received 
the ultimate punishment from God. And that was being taken from the very land God had given them. And to prove this, I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 28. <coughs> now this chapter, along with chapter 27, record the blessings and the cursings of the law. Now we know we're not under the law of Moses. We're all under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But the law did never pass away. The law is within us. Deuteronomy 28 verse 63 says this, And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and you shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. Now in exile, and without proper forms of Jewish worship available, because there was no more temple, the task given to Ezekiel was manifold, as I said previously. Through the reading of the book Ezekiel, you will find that he was to do several things. And I've picked out four specific things that he was called to do. Number one, Ezekiel had to convince the people of God of his absolute hatred of idolatry and upon the promised judgment upon those who practised it. That is, worshipping something else other than God something more important in their life than God. That goes for us too, brethren. Number two, he had to show them that the Babylonian captors were now the instruments of God. For this, they were not to be resisted. Remember, Jeremiah encouraged the people to go freely into captivity, into Babylon. They were not to be resisted because they were the instruments of God. And they would be judged themselves afterwards. But they were not to be resisted. Number three. He had to convince them that their presumption that this captivity would be short-lived was a lie. That they were now under the judgment of God. Finally, number four. He was to encourage them into the understanding that there was an ultimate purpose to this devastating judgment. And that purpose, that ultimate purpose, was that being the eventual restoration of God's people into their inheritance in the land. That's always God's ultimate end in any correction of his people, is to bring them back into their inheritance, into a good relationship with God. Now how does this, how does this relate to us today, you might ask? Well, I said previously that this call of Ezekiel was similar to the instruction of the Apostle John at the beginning of the book of Revelation. And so it is, brethren. The tribes making up the northern nation of Israel had already faced their judgment. They went into captivity into Assyria. Now the southern tribes making up the nation of Judah, not learning from their sisters' mistakes, were now captive in Babylon. However, God had promised that they would be in the land, back in the land, when Messiah came. When their Messiah would come to them. And we see this recorded for us in Genesis 49 verse 10. Genesis 49 verse 10. You may not have read this, you may not know this, but this is a fact. Genesis 49 verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. 
and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now the scepter speaks of rulership, kingship. So it's saying here that the word Shiloh is the Hebrew word Shiloh, Shiloh, meaning he whose it is, he whose it is, that which belongs to him. It's also an epithet of the Messiah. So I'll read it again. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh or Shiloh come. That is the Messiah. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, Israel continued to have a king, didn't they? Right up until the time of Jesus. Herod was the king when Jesus was born. Now this is reinforced by the following scriptures. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. <coughs> so, speaking of the Messiah, Jesus there. He was the Word of God. He is the Word of God. And we, he ma all things were made by him, and without him nothing was made. Now Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. Please bear with me here, brethren. Follow me with these scriptures. Colossians 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. It is now for the body of Christ to open their eyes and see that God has allowed this that is happening to the body of Christ today. The forced closing of churches has been allowed to shake us from our slumber brethren. For the vast majority of the church is most definitely either asleep or in a daze, bewitched. Remember, brethren, how arrogant Israel and Judah ignored all of the prophets' warnings of coming judgment if they did not repent and turn back to God. They were happy and comfortable with their lives, living the same way that the pagans did in the pagan nations all around them, yet still blindly going on with temple rituals and worship and rites. Living in a pagan way and yet going into the temple of God. Do we do any different, brethren? The task that Ezekiel was given, as I have said, was first and foremost to convince the people of God in his day that this way of life was abhorrent to God and that their ritual sacrifices were therefore meaningless. Even worse, they were an insult to the Holy God. Now the church today, brethren, should be under no illusions. Under no illusions, God has in no way changed. He is still the one true living God. He is holy. He is righteous. He is pure and just. For the people of God, Israel, they could not but be continually judged and corrected by Almighty God for their erroneous ways. Brethren, in a sense, they had an excuse because they did not have what we have today. They do not have the forgiveness of sins through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They could not be born again. We are. 
All that they had was a temporary covering of sin by the blood of animals. And now even that had been taken away. Yes, the temple would be rebuilt when the remnant returned to the land, but God would be quiet for over 400 years after that until the appearance of Messiah Yeshua in the land. The reason being, a new way was coming. And indeed, a new way did come through Jesus Christ, our Sovereign Lord. We saw that similar words to that given by Eze to Ezekiel sorry, were given to the Apostle Paul. That is because God knows that man has not changed. We are still weak. We are easily deceived. We are afraid to stand out. We are afraid to be different to those all around us. This was something that God and the Lord Jesus knows well because he saw it in his own life by, to those around him. What Paul was to preach to man was that we need to die and be reborn in the likeness of another. Yes, we must submit to death with Christ on the cross and be raised with him anew. This new life as disciples or believers of Christ literally makes us different. We are different, brethren. We are new creations. We are now light in a dark world, or we're supposed to be. See here in Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. Verse 14. You, that is you, listening to this, who were born again of the Spirit of God, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, or a basket, that is, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That is to be us, brethren. We are the light in this world. <coughs> we are not to hide our light. How are the brothers and sisters? Jesus knows that we, even as born again believers, are still weak and fallible, susceptible to trips and falls, etc. This being because we are not yet perfected. We are not yet perfected, brethren. We are still vulnerable to falls and trips and mistakes. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52 say this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ, sorry, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Hallelujah. I'm going to read that again. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is obviously speaking of when we, as believers, meet the risen Christ in the air together. However, until that point, brethren, we are still vulnerable to attack from the world, from the flesh, and from the devil. This, my dear brethren, is why we are told in no uncertain terms by the Apostle Paul to be fully clothed with the armour of God. Failure to wear it, or failure to 
properly use it will result in serious damage to us spiritually. Worse still, failure to have on this armour at all or use it unwisely can and will result in you being drawn back into the old ways of life and into this world. Why do you think there are such warnings as these in the Word of God? And I'm going to read from, first of all, from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 to 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 to 18. Verse 15, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. You, brethren, are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And further we're going to read from Revelation chapter 18. We're almost coming to the end there, brethren. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. This is a cry to the body of Christ in the world in the last days, brethren. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Now brethren, these New Testament warnings are as real and as important for us today to heed and to understand as were the warnings to the people of God by the prophet Ezekiel. Now there's even more of a similarity between us and the people of God in Ezekiel's day. When the people of Judah went into exile into Babylon, there were possibly hundreds of thousands who were taken out of the land and into Babylon, into the land of the Chaldeans. However, when the exiles returned to the land of Israel under Ezra and Nehemiah, only around between 45 and 50,000 returned. Yes, between 45 and 50,000 only returned. In other words, a remnant returned to the land. So we are told it will be in the last day. And I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 25, verses 6 to 13. Matthew 25, verses 6 to 13. Matthew 25, verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily I said, say unto you, I know you not. Watch ye therefore. For you know not, neither the day nor the hour, wherein the Son of Man cometh. And finally, brethren, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. 
Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. This is the penultimate scripture. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, in these days where the world is covered in gross darkness, do you agree? I hope you do. The world that we live in is covered in gross darkness. It is even more important that we, who are true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, burn as brightly as we can in this world. This world has absolutely nothing that we could either need or want. So why stray so close to it? Here at the beginning of a new year, as I said 2022, I implore each and every one of you to read and heed the Word of God. Draw close to Christ and stay there. In closing, please remember this from the wisest man who ever lived. King Solomon, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So brethren, until the next time, may God richly bless and keep you in his love. Amen.